right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to day four of our uh, boot camp. It is my great pleasure to introduce Alina Anne, who will be present kicking off uh, today's tutorials. Um, before the proper introduction, saying something about the talk today, I wanted to uh, take a step back and see where we are in the entire plan of material we're covering this week. So if yesterday was sketching day, then today is optimization day. I guess we're slowly moving from our graph algorithms towards more linear algebraic problems. So hopefully you can see some of the ties uh, between everything. Um, the plan for today in the morning, um, so, so today is optimization day. However, we decided to spread the coverage of optimization uh, methods among a few different speakers, depending on the different types of optimization methods. So in the morning, we're gonna have two lectures by uh, Alina on first order optimization methods. This afternoon we'll have uh, two talks uh, by Diksha on uh, higher order optimization methods. And then tomorrow we'll tie this together with uh, sketching algorithms. We'll have um, uh, a talk on uh, dynamic, uh, we'll, we'll tie it with our sketching and our dynamic algorithms. We'll talk about dynamic, uh, there'll be a talk on dynamic algorithms uh, for matrix problems or dynamic data structures for more linear algebraic problems. And the final uh, two talks on uh, interior point methods, kind of completing the coverage of, of all of these, all these material. Um, so that's the plan for today. Um, I am uh, grateful that uh, Lena uh, Eni, who is uh, also one of the organizers of the, the program and the organizer of the optimization and uh, algorithm design workshop, has volunteered to present. Thank you so much for agreeing to present today. Um, Alina is a professor at uh, Boston University where she um, has done a number of uh, exciting works, both on in optimization very broadly. Uh, her work spans, I think, both continuous optimization and combinatorial optimization with some exciting work on the intersection, for example, problems like some modular optimization. So again, well suited to kind of give a tutorial on first order optimization methods in light of all the ties with everything else in the program. So thank you again, and I look forward to your talk. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Aaron, for the very generous uh, introduction. And thanks, thanks to everyone who woke up early to come and everyone who might be listening online. So uh, as Aaron mentioned, I'm uh, delighted to uh, kickstart our uh, discussion of optimization with uh, first order methods, so it's like gradient descent. Uh, so first, let me uh, set up the, the basic problem, which I'm sure many of you have seen before. Uh, so, so in this talk, we're going to look at the basic problem of convex minimization. Uh, so, so we have some objective function f uh, in d dimensions, which could be quite high dimensional. And we're going to assume it's convex. Uh, so we, we are going to recap what convex is in a second, if you haven't seen it. So, so we have this convex objective. And for simplicity, we're going to assume that it's differentiable. So it has uh, uh, a, a derivative, or in general, a gradient in higher dimensions. And we like to minimize this uh, subject to potentially some constraints. It could be unconstrained, but it could also have some constraints. And uh, this constraint set is going to be some convex uh, set in the dimensions. And uh, in this talk, we're going to assume that it's actually fairly structured. And um, more specifically, we assume that we can uh, project onto it. So, so given a point that is potentially outside of the set, we would like to find the closest point in Euclidean distance to the set. All right. And the computation model that we're going to consider in the lectures this morning, and uh, we're, uh, we're going to step away from it in the afternoon, is that of uh, first order optimization. And what that means is that we, we here we assume access to, uh, to gradients. And in fact, uh, for the purposes of these lectures, we can even think of the gradients as being given to us in a black box way. So we don't really see the function. All we see is gradients. So, so given a point in the feasible domain, any query point, I'm going to get back the gradient at that point. And given this uh, gradient oracle, we want to design an iterative method that, uh, that gives us a, an approximate solution for the minimization problem. So, 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 so here, we're not interested in solving it exactly. Instead, we assume we are given any accuracy epsilon. And we like to find a point uh, that is within epsilon in function value of the minimum value. Uh, f of x star. So throughout x star is going to be the uh, one of the minimizers of the function, and we want to be within epsilon of f of x star. And the focus is going to be on designing iterative methods that uh, proceed in iterations, and they uh, they construct uh, a sequence of solutions x1, x2, and so on that we can use to build our final solution at the end. And we would like these, uh, uh, these iterations to be fairly cheap and the number of the iterations to be as small as you can manage in order to get the most efficient algorithms that we can. So, so, so this is uh, the, the goal. 
And, and we're going to see a uh, so, uh, paradigmatic approach to this, so that is based on gradient descent and extensions, and we're also going to see some connections uh, to discrete optimization and beyond. Uh, but before the, we do that, uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, let me also do a little bit of a quick background, which many of you probably already know, but in case there's someone in the audience who, who hasn't seen these at least recently. So let me uh, uh, do a quick recap of convexity, since this is a, the most fundamental structure that is going to underpin everything we talk about today. So, so first of all, so what are convex sets? Uh, so, so, so these are sets where uh, if we have two points in the set, and if we look at the line segment between them, every point on the line segment is also in the set. Right? So for example, uh, on the picture on the left, it is convex, but on the, um, on the right is not convex. And how about convex functions? So, so remember, we remember those from calculus as well. So, so these are the, the functions where uh, uh, the, the graph of the function, so the curve, lies be, below any, any chord. And uh, there are many examples of convex functions, uh, uh, a lot of familiar ones that uh, we study in calculus, like the exponential, uh, the negative logarithm, um, uh, polynomial functions as that squared, x minus two, square root of x. And of course, there are also high dimensional functions that are convex. Uh, some really structured ones are affine functions, right? So linear functions with an offset and, uh, and quadratic functions, right? So, so not all quadratic functions are convex, but many of them are. Uh, and specifically, uh, the quadratics that are convex are the ones that look like this, right? So we have a quadratic form, like in Sushant's lecture, x transpose ax, plus an affine function. And uh, what we need in order for this quadratic to be convex is that uh, that matrix A is positive semi-definite, right? Uh, hopefully, uh, this is a bit familiar, given the lectures uh, from Sushant's series. And positive semi-definite means that the eigenvalues of the matrix are non-negative. All right. Uh, so, so that's uh, uh, that's uh, the the usual definition that we see of convexity. But it turns out, for uh, for algorithm design uh, like the one that we're going to be doing today, there's actually uh, a different uh, but equivalent definition that is also very nice to work with. And and which is this one? So, so here that the picture is very different. So instead of uh, looking at the function as lying be below its chords, um, we're actually looking at uh, what happens when we take uh, the first order, uh, order Taylor approximation of the function at any given point. So, so let's say at x, right? Uh, so, so, so if the function is convex, uh, a very nice property is that uh, the Taylor approximation at x actually gives us a global lower bound on the function everywhere. And this, in fact, is a characterization uh, for differentiable functions. So, so this is very nice, and we're going to explore this quite a bit. And it is very useful because it gives us a basic way uh, to give a lower bound on the function value of the optimum by, uh, by looking at, at, at this uh, very simple affine function that is giving us a lower bound of the function everywhere. And uh, the nice thing about this is that it works even if the function is non-differentiable. So convex functions have what are called subgradients, which play exactly the role of the gradient in the previous uh, characterization. So, so if we replace the gradient by a subgradient, we're going to have the same property. So we get a, a lower bound. In fact, now we get many lower bounds but it, because there could be many subgradients. All right. Uh, so with that background in mind, let us uh, go ahead and start talking about algorithms. And, um, and as I mentioned, the goal here is to design iterative algorithms that are very efficient. Uh, so they, they have simple iterations that can be implemented very efficiently using a gradient oracle, and they do very few iterations. And whenever I mention such a goal, probably many of you are thinking gradient descent. So, so this is a very familiar framework that many of us have seen. And what does it look like? Well, so, so it uses this uh, very uh, nice fact that we've seen in calculus that if you look at the derivative or the gradient, uh, it points in, in the direction in which the function increases the fastest. So that means that if we look at the negative of the gradient, it points in the direction uh, where the function value decreases the fastest. 
So, so that sounds like a great direction in which to move in order to improve the objective value. So if we are at quantum point x or xt, uh, let us move in the direction of the negative of the gradient using some step size that we, we choose. And hopefully we're going to make progress. So, so this is the template. So we choose an initial point and we then we iterate for capital T iterations. And in every iteration, we choose some step size and perform the simple gradient descent step. So, so, so this works, assuming that we're doing unconstrained minimization. Question, uh, no. Okay, great, yeah, okay. So, so Michael's question was, um, so, so the intuition that I presented was that if we move in the direction of the negative gradient, we will hopefully make progress. But here we're not, uh, so looking at this template, uh, I mentioned that I, either we return the last iterate or sometimes we return the average. So, so why do we return the average? So we're actually going to come back to that uh, a little bit later. So, so maybe if you hold out that question, it will be answered uh, not too long from now. But that is a great question. So, um, great. All right, so, so, so that's the basic gradient descent of this scheme. Uh, so it's only a template. And, um, and uh, we can return some solution at the end, right? So, so this was going to construct a sequence of iterates and we can return a solution at the end. So, so there are uh, several options here. So one option would be that we actually return the iterate that had the smallest function value. Just go and evaluate all of these iterates, see which one has minimum function value and just return that. And that one is okay, uh, it is fine. The downside is that we have to evaluate the function on all of these iterates and that could be expensive. So, so usually we don't want to do that and it turns out that there's a, um, uh, an approach that doesn't require any function evaluations that uh, simply returns either, let's say the last iterate, so, so this works for certain problems, or we return the uniform average of the iterates so that also works for some other problems. And we're going to see in, later in the talk exactly when when each of these approaches is, uh, is uh, fruitful, okay? But uh, just, uh, just to emphasize here, and which, which is also what uh, Michael probably alluded as well, is that this is only a template because we're not actually giving an algorithm here because we're not saying how to choose the step size. And actually, in my mind, that is the key algorithmic uh, problem here. So how do we choose the step size? And this is what uh, we're try we'll try to understand along the way. <coughs> okay. So, so that is gradient descent for unconstrained uh, optimization. So when we don't have any constraints, uh, sorry, yeah, question? Uh, yeah, I was wondering, is there an example where evaluating the function value is more expensive than the gradient? Stochastic gradient. Uh, so yeah, so the question is, is there an example where evaluating the function is more expensive than evaluating a gradient? I can give you an example <coughs> if you replace gradient by stochastic gradient, which is, let's say, deep learning. So in deep learning, you have this function, which is the, a loss function over many uh, points, data points in your data set. Evaluating means you're going to make a complete class over the data set, which is very expensive. And usually we can get cheap approximations to the gradient by computing what is called the stochastic gradient, which we'll see later on in this lecture as well. And that is very cheap. So, so we wouldn't want to spend uh, one function evaluation for iteration in that way. Also, stochastic function evaluation and do that instead. Yeah, so, so the suggestion is maybe we can do stochastic function evaluation. Yeah, those are great ideas. So we can definitely talk about it more. Okay. All right, good. So, so this is great. And it has a very simple update uh, in the unconstrained setting. Um, and uh, at this point, it's not immediate how we would do gradient descent if we actually had a non-trivial constraint. And, uh, and to that end, let me actually introduce a uh, equivalent, but uh, perhaps different uh, perspective on this update. So, so here's one way I like to think about the gradient descent update, even in the unconstrained setting. So, so I like to think about it as actually an optimization problem that gradient descent is performing locally, which is the following, right? So, so as we mentioned, convexity has this beautiful property that 
if we look at the affine approximation given by the first order Taylor uh, approximation, uh, we get this nice lower bound on the function, uh, which coincides with the actual function at xt, but of course it starts becoming a sort of loose approximation elsewhere. So, so, so one idea we could have is that we could actually approximate the function locally uh, by this linear or affine approximation and, and minimize that affine approximation instead. But of course, we don't want to just do that because then we will shoot off to minus infinity uh, because this approximation is not good if we actually step away too much from xt. So we also want to be mindful of how much we're moving away from xt. So in other words, the, uh, the, the iterate movement between xt plus one and xt. So, so an idea that we could have here is actually to combine those two objectives. So let us minimize a combination of the affine approximation and this movement, and we can weigh them uh, however we like. And, and the, the specific weight that we're putting here on the movement is given by the, the step size, right? So we have one over eta t, uh, giving us uh, the, the weight on the movement. So, 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 so if we, uh, depending on whether we make eta t smaller or larger, we're going to emphasize one of the two components more, either the affine approximation or the movement. All right, and, and this uh, uh, optimization perspective will actually come into uh, play uh, when we analyze uh, gradient descent and design the step sizes, uh, but we could immediately use it uh, to get an update for constraint optimization. So now all I have to do is actually to uh, put my uh, constraint into this optimization, right? So before it was just uh, any point in R to the D and now I'm actually requiring that I'm optimizing over the feasible set K. Okay. And, um, and of course we can simplify this update uh, rule a fair bit because a lot of the terms that we have here are constant, they don't actually depend on y, which is the variable over which we're minimizing, so we can drop them. So, so, so that, that could be simplified quite a bit, so by dropping constant terms. So, so that gives us an update for gradient descent. It works for both unconstrained and constrained minimization. And by the way, for, for those of you um, who are not sure why uh, this, uh, this optimization is actually equivalent to the original uh, update when, uh, when we have uh, unconstrained, so k is all r to the d. So it's, uh, we can derive that by, by usual calculus, right? So we take the derivative and set it to zero and we'll see that that's exactly what happens there. All right. So an equivalent way to think about this uh, gradient descent is what is called projected gradient descent, uh, which is again, this idea that we can take the derivative and set it to zero, right? And if we do that, we're going to get the, the, uh, uh, the unconstrained gradient descent that, uh, step that we saw before, right? So that is going to take us from ST to some other point, X tilde T plus one here. Uh, but uh, now we could actually be outside of our feasible domain so, so just like in calculus, what we do is we, we project uh, the point into the feasible domain. So we find the closest point in the domain that is uh, to this point in Euclidean distance. And that is going to give us the next iterand. So, so this is a completely equivalent way of viewing that optimization. Right? Otherwise, you get the projection squared in the addition process. Yes, exactly. So, say by this gradient, I'll get right a gradient at x t. Oh, sorry, I forgot to <laughs> repeat the question. So, so, the question was whether this is truly equivalent, and yes, I, I think that, uh, yeah. Michael uh, convinced himself that it is. So, yeah. So, if we just take the gradient set it to zero, we're going to get uh, the usual uh, gradient, unconstrained um, gradient descent update. And uh, we have to project it into the physical side. All right. Okay. So, so that's, uh, uh, that's, that will allow us to do constraint optimization, but of course, uh, we immediately see an immediate caveat, right? Which is that we need an efficient algorithm to, uh, to compute this projection onto the feasible set. Or in other words, we need to be able to minimize the simple quadratics that we're writing here in, uh, in the update. And this need not be the case for all of the uh, optimization problems we have, right? So sometimes constraints can be very complicated. 
Um, but for algorithm design, there are quite a few settings where th this is possible, or at least a, a few settings where this is possible, which are very important. So, uh, so uh, one setting is when uh, the constraints are fairly simple, uh, and it allows us to actually analytically compute the projection. So for example, thinking, uh, think of a ball, uh, a Euclidean ball, right? So we're looking at all of the points uh, that are within a certain distance from a, a given point. Uh, there, uh, if you think about it, and I'm going to leave it as an exercise, you can convince yourself that it's very easy to compute the, the projection. And in fact, uh, it need not be balls uh, in the Euclidean norm. It can be balls in other norms as well and other simple constraints like that. And a far less simple constraint uh, that is uh, very relevant uh, to, to this program and what we've seen quite a bit uh, throughout uh, the lecture so far is uh, certain structure problems that arise in combinatorial problems such as maximum flows. And, and we saw in uh, uh, Sushant's uh, lecture the, this concept of electrical flow. And, um, and in electrical flows, we're trying to, uh, to do a quadratic optimization over a, over a constraint, which is actually a Laplacian linear system. So, so we need to sa satisfy um, a system of linear equations of the form L times X equals B, where L is a Laplacian. And uh, Laplacians are very structured, as we've seen, and they have very fast Laplacian solvers. So, so, this, so that is very helpful here because it allows us to do non-trivial quadratic optimization over those uh, uh, systems. So, so that is another very interesting example. And if you're interested in this direction, you could, of course, talk more to Aaron and Intar and, and the, the rest of the experts that are here at the workshop and beyond. All right. All right, good. But now, uh, coming back to the algorithm and, uh, and or sort of a rather the algorithmic template and thinking forward towards actually designing an actual algorithm, uh, let us come back to this point that this is actually not an algorithm beyond because it is missing a very key ingredient, which is how do we set the step sizes, right? Uh, and that, is, as you can imagine, uh, very intuitively uh, will make significant difference if we're interested in efficient uh, running time. So, so if we make really, really, really tiny steps, uh, we can make progress because that's what we learned from calculus, like Michael was uh, mentioning. Uh, but if, uh, if otherwise, um, uh, if we're interested in very fast running time, then we would want to make step sizes that are as large as possible so that we make a lot of progress. And in order to do that, uh, we need to have a judicious choice of step sizes. And if you think about it for a bit, you realize that in general, this is a very hard task without any additional assumptions on the function beyond convexity, because this is a local algorithm that is looking at the gradient. So, so, if, uh, so if the gradient can be very large and change dramatically, we, we cannot, intuitively, we cannot make very large step sizes. So we'll need some assumptions on the gradients. Uh, so let, let us see some, uh, some, some nice structure that arises in, in many settings that gives us uh, quite a bit of structure for the gradients that can be used to design uh, fast running time via gradient design. So, uh, so one structure which is very beneficial is when the gradients don't change very fast, right? So, uh, so, so, you see, so the, the technical term for that is that the gradient is Lipschitz. Um, and this is what we call smooth, uh, smooth functions. So we say that a function f is self smooth if, um, if uh, we don't move too much uh, from the current point, then the gradient doesn't change too much. Okay. And how much we change is, uh, is the parameter of the smoothness l. All right. So, so what's an example? Uh, so, so we can consider, for example, quadratic functions. So as I say, just a simple quadratic form, x transpose ax, with a positive semi-definite matrix A. Uh, so, so it turns out that another way to think about smoothness when the function is twice differentiable is to actually look at the Hessian. And uh, smoothness means that the Hessian is upper bounded in a PSD sense by uh, L times the identity matrix. So, so in other words, the, the uh, eigenvalues are upper bounded by L. So, uh, so, so if we look at a quadratic, its smoothness is going to be the largest eigenvalue of the matrix. Okay. Good. All right. 
so, so why is Moon as helpful? Well, intuitively, because we're assuming the gradient is not changing very fast, it should be helpful, but exact, uh, let us get at the heart as to why this might be helpful. And to do that, let us make this simple observation, which uh, will take a little bit of integration, but uh, I'm sure many of you can do it offline. So if we take the definition of smoothness and we actually do some simple integration, we'll see that it implies this very nice property, which is that we get a, a quadratic upper bound on the function at any point x. And this quadratic is simply that Taylor approximation that saw before plus this very simple uh, quadratic term, which is the distance squared between x where we're expanding and any point we like, the current points at which we're upper bounding, right? So, so why is this helpful? Well, it's because it gives us a very structured proxy for the actual function. So, so the actual function f could be very complicated, but this uh, blue function here, which is the quadratic upper bound from smoothness, is actually a very simple quadratic. And in particular, uh, we, we can minimize quad, uh, quadratic functions uh, efficiently. So this is our assumption. So, so we can use the quadratic function as a proxy for the actual objective and minimize it instead of the actual function. Right. So, so let's see what happens if we do that. Well, if we do that, then we're going to arrive at this update where the next point is the minimizer of this uh, quadratic upper bound, which is exactly gradient descent if we set the step sizes to be one over the smoothness. So, so, so this automatically give us uh, a choice for the step sizes in the smooth setting, simply by looking at this proxy for the function and minimizing it instead. Okay. Uh, but why is that a good idea? Well, it's because this actually is doing something useful, or at least it's not hurting us, which is that uh, the objective is guaranteed not to increase. So the function value at the next iterate is actually at most the function value at uh, the current iterate. And, uh, and we can see that, uh, that this is the case just by looking at the properties that we have for this uh, quadratic, right? So, so first, uh, the quadratic coincides with f at xt, right? Uh, that's, that's a nice property of it. And then we chose xt plus one to be the minimizer of the quadratic. So, so the uh, so, so, so that's, uh, I, and that is an upper bound on the function value itself. So, so those two things together tell us that we're not making the function value worse. You know, potentially we could be improving. So, so we get this very nice guaranteed monotonicity on function values where we are not going to increase the function value at any point. And in fact, we'll be able to show that this algorithm converges at a good rate. Uh, and we're going to come back to this later. Uh, but the rate that we can show for it is that after t iteration, the function value gap between the, the iterate and uh, the optimum uh, decreases as, at a rate of one over t. Which means that if we use one of our epsilon iterations, uh, then we can actually ensure that we have an optimal approximate solution. So, so we're going to come back to this analysis later, but any questions on smooth gradient descent? So, so, so at least in this uh, nice structure setting where we have smooth uh, Lipschitz gradients, um, we can actually derive a fairly fast uh, running time, which is, uh, uh, which, is, which is quite good, as we'll see. Um, so so, so it, another question is whether we can do better with additional structure. And, and what could be some uh, useful structure that we could have? Actually, uh, another structure that we could look at in addition to this. Yeah. Is there a model where you can look at axis gradients? Is there some kind of understanding of all of them in the sense that it has this very fixed function as you go along? Yes, exactly. Right. 
Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So Michael asked, is there a lower bound in some adversarial model uh, that says that given that we only have this uh, black box access to these, um, uh, these gradients, uh, that we need to do a certain number of iteration? And the answer is yes, that's exactly right. Uh, so that is another very nice uh, uh, aspect of the black box model that we can actually give a lower bound. Uh, so, so the lower bound in this case is square root of one over epsilon. And we're going to see uh, later on in the talk, well, in the, second, uh, in the second lecture, we're going to see algorithms that achieve that iteration complexity. And that is going to be tied if we only have smoother. Um, so, the, it says the question is uh, so, so, this is for deterministic. Um, uh, what is known for randomized algorithms? Um, yeah, maybe let me think about it and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in the break. Yeah. Uh, the same, same. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're not, if you're dimension independent, if you're allowed to depend on dimension, the story changes. Mm -hmm. but, but if you're dimension independent, So, so that's smooth gradient descent. So, so that is input for some additional structure, which is also uh, common in certain applications, that will give an even more power to us. So, so, so we saw that smoothness gives us these quadratic upper bounds on, on the objective at every point. So these uh, simple quadratics, right? <laughs> where we have the affine approximation plus a distance square term. Uh, there's a lower bound counterpart of that, which is called strong convexity, right? So we saw the convexity meant that if we look at the affine approximation, it's a global lower bound. And when the function is strongly convex, we actually get much more. So we get a quadratic lower bound, which is the affine approximation, plus the uh, a quadratic term, which is the, the proportions of the distance squared. And if we have both of the two things together, this is what's called a well-conditioned function, which is both smooth and strongly convex. And its condition number is the ratio of those two uh, numbers, the smoothness and the uh, strong convexity, which is at least one, as you can see from these inequalities. And the smaller it is, the better condition the function is. And as we'll see, this is actually very helpful for gradient descent. So, so if we, uh, so, if, so, so what's an example of that? Well, actually that, uh, uh, a quadratic function example that we looked at before, it's, it's both smooth and strongly convex um, because a smoothness gives us upper bound on the eigenvalues and uh, uh, strong convexity gives us a lower bound on the eigenvalues. So, so we, can, uh, we can use the largest eigenvalue for the smoothness and the smallest eigenvalue for the strong convexity. And, um, and the condition number is the, uh, the maximum eigenvalue over the minimum eigenvalue. And, uh, and for these quadratics, we can also pictorially see how they look like when they're well-conditioned versus not so well-conditioned. So, so, so here on, uh, on, on, the, on the right, we have a well-conditioned function where if we look at the contour plot, we'll see that these level sets are very nice and spherical. But the, uh, on the other picture, um, the eigenvalues are skewed. So one is one and the other one is five. And we can see that the level sets become very ellipse-like. And that it turns out that that gradient descent is going to converge very differently depending on which picture we're in. All right. So, so what, what can we say uh, about gradient descent uh, for uh, uh, well-conditioned functions? Well, the first thing is that we don't have to change the algorithm. We can just use the smooth gradient descent algorithm with step sizes uh, that are given by the smoothness. And if we have a well-conditioned problem, then our convergence guarantee actually improves dramatically. So before it was one over epsilon, right? So it was a polynomial a dependency on the accuracy parameter. But if we have a well-conditioned problem, actually that improves exponentially to just logarithm of one over epsilon, which is significantly better as many of us know, right? Um, so, so this allows us to get extremely accurate solutions um, very efficiently. Not the upper bound on the change of gradient. Does that help gradient descent? 
That helps gradient descent for a specific class of functions, which is called uh, Lipschitz functions. So, so if we have an upper bound on the gradient, oh, sorry, I forgot to. Yeah, let, let me repeat your question since I forgot. Sorry. So Michael asked, what if we have only strong convexity and not smoothness? Does that help gradient descent? The answer is yes, uh, not in general, but uh, for a very important class of functions, uh, namely the ones that have bounded gradients. Just think of like the L1 norm or the absolute value. It's, uh, it's non-smooth, uh, but the gradient is the most one. Um, so, so for those, uh, we can get this kind of convergence, one over epsilon with an appropriately set step size. I see some gradients can change fast. The gradients can change fast, but uh, there's only so much damage they can do because they're bounded. And bounded gradients is uh, it's, uh, equivalent to the function being Lipschitz. The function itself, not the gradient. Smoothness is the gradient is Lipschitz, uh, but in that case, the function itself is Lipschitz. Yeah. Just while going through rates, do you mind going back to the gradient descent rate? Or? Uh, if it's not too far back. Sure. Yeah, one, four. Yeah. Um, it, when you said the convergence there, was that asymptotic for f of xt minus f of x star less than l? Like, is that correct with the constants, or is that hiding constants? Actually, the constant here is even better. It's a two at the bottom. Two at the bottom? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a one half of what I put here. Ah, so it's even better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. But and here, you're right, though, that... Oh, sorry. Did I repeat the... Uh, no, it's okay. That was my okay. Question. Uh, so here, right, that I actually omitted the problem const constants <laughs> into this big O, right? So, so here, this is actually L times the initial distance squared divided by epsilon iteration, right? All we're saying here is that take this, set it to epsilon, and then that gives you... Well, good to know. This should be the numerator, not the denominator, but okay, good to know. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, I think it's... Uh, uh, we're, we're going to do this analysis. Um, okay. All right. So you use the same step for well conditioned functions? Yes, in gradient descent. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sorry, the question was do we use the same step size for well conditioned as we did for smooth? And the answer is yes, in gradient descent. So the gradient descent uh, scheme that we can use for well conditioned is the same one, but we get much faster convergence because of the strong complexity. All right. So, so, so these are uh, some basic bounds uh, that, that we, we can get via gradient descent. And an actual question, which was already asked by Michael, was can we actually achieve faster convergence? And the answer is, fortunately and amazingly, yes. Uh, so, so there is the, a different class uh, of gradient descent methods, which is called accelerated gradient descent methods. It's actually, there are quite a few of them that have been developed over the years. And, uh, and they actually give a faster conversion rate than this basic gradient descent algorithm that we, we saw here. And we're going to talk about these accelerator methods in the second part uh, um, of uh, this lecture. And, uh, and uh, uh, this dates back uh, to some, some really fundamental work by Polyak uh, for uh, quadratic functions and uh, later on by Nesrov for uh, general convex functions. And there have been many subsequent developments. And in, in, uh, in the second part uh, of this lecture, we're going to talk about two of those developments. So we're going to see two related algorithms uh, that achieve this faster convergence rate. And what is this faster convergence rate? Well, uh, so if the function is smooth, uh, what we're going to get is that we're going to be able to improve that one over epsilon to a square root of one over epsilon, which is a quadratic improvement. It might not seem like much, but this is actually very significant, both in theory and in practice. And, uh, uh, and for well conditions, we can once again get a quadratic improvement, but this time on, on the condition number. So the condition number goes from kappa to square root of kappa. And this is, a, again, extremely helpful if uh, the problem is uh, well conditioned, but the condition number is very large. So imagine a quadratic, which is extremely skewed you would much rather pay the square root of the condition number than the condition number itself. And uh, even more amazing is that these convergence rates are optimal in this black box model of computation where we only assume that uh, the only access that we have to the function is via querying this black box uh, gradient oracle that takes a point and gives us back the gradient. Um, 
So, so, so if we, uh, we are in very high dimensions, we can uh, have these black box functions for which in order to learn how to uh, approximate them well, we need to make this many queries to the black box uh, Oracle gradient. All right, uh, and that gives us a very nice complete picture, which is another very useful property uh, of this framework. Yeah. Yes, yeah, great question. So Moses asked, are there lower bounds if we have stochastic gradients? Uh, and the, the answer is yes. Uh, so the, the ones that uh, Aaron mentioned um, in response to Michael's question. So, so we have the same lower bounds in a uh, dimension independent setting. Just worth mentioning when once you say stochastic or you change something, there's like a variety of different assumptions that people consider <laughs> beyond. And I guess when you say stochastic, there's you get different answers depending on what you assume about noise and for designing the algorithms. Is, is your noise relative to the norm of the gradient? Is your noise some like fixed additive thing? You can get all sorts of different answers. Is there a realistic model that matches the use of stochastic gradient design when your function is the sum of terms? You sample one term and with gradient of that one term. So, so, uh, so, so, so I, like, there's a lot of natural bounds for that, but even when you run that, are you assuming your functions are smooth, like the gradients are Lipschitz, or are you assuming that the, sorry, just that the function itself is Lipschitz and the gradient is bounded? So, even when you analyze that, you can get different things depending on which assumption you're making about your individual constituent functions. I'm happy to have a much, much longer. Conversation. Yeah. Likewise, Sorry, I can also yeah. add to that. Uh, please correct it's, me it's, if I got any of that wrong. <laughs> uh, no, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, so that is the most relevant. Uh, so, so I assume that's uh, what you meant. Since that is the most relevant to discrete algorithm design, um, I, I can add to that um, uh, lower bounds from from a Bayesian model of uh, stochastic optimization, which is very common in the analysis of stochastic gradient descent, the same machine learning, which is that we have stochastic gradients that have bounded variance. And uh, under uh, and if we only assume that we have so so that means that so 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 we're given back black box access to this stochastic gradient oracle that returns a random variable whose expectation is the gradient so it's an unbiased estimate of the gradient and we assume that the variance of this estimator is uh, is bounded and uh, and we have lower bounds for that that setting that uh, quantifies how the convergence uh, uh, deteriorates as the variance is increasing. So when the variance is zero, we we are here at one over uh, like one over uh, square root of t. But as uh, as sigma is increasing, we actually get uh, sigma over square root of t. So that's a uh, sigma over epsilon squared differential. Uh, so so that's another uh, very tight, uh, clean um, perspective. Uh, is that a realistic uh, assumption in machine learning, bounded variance? Sometimes it is, sometimes it is not. I'm happy to talk more about that later in the break. Okay, good, great. So, um, so in the remaining few minutes, let me, uh, oh, sorry, any other questions on this? So in the remaining uh, few minutes, let me actually a step away from smooth functions. So smooth functions are great, but unfortunately for us, uh, sometimes the objectives are non-smooth. And, uh, and uh, we've, uh, for uh, those of us who do algorithm design and discrete optimization and combinatorial optimization, uh, we've uh, often written continuous formulations of these combinatorial optimization problems uh, that are non-smooth. And uh, one example that has been a running theme throughout the lecture so far is uh, maximum flow. Let's say unit capacity maximum flow, right? So, so typically, uh, and the unit capacity is just for simplicity here. Uh, so, so it's typically, right, so maximum flow, we are given a graph and a source and a S and destination D, and we want to send as much flow as possible from S to D. Um, so a different from, uh, way to think about the maximum flow problem is actually as a congestion minimization. So instead of sending as much flow as possible from S to T, let's just route exactly one unit of flow and uh, minimize congestion. So, so how much flow we have on any edge relative to the capacity. 
So in this case, the capacitors are one, so it's just we're looking at the maximum flow on any edge. So, so this gives us uh, this uh, continuous formulation of the problem, which is extremely powerful, as we saw in Sushant's uh, lectures, where we're minimizing the maximum entry of the flow vector, right? So the L infinity norm, subject to this constraint that we're writing exactly one unit of SD flow, which we can very uh, neatly uh, um, encapsulate using this Laplace linear system uh, with B being this vertex edge incident matrix, this powerful linear algebraic um, uh, object uh, that is so helpful for maximum flow. So unfortunately for us, this is a non-smooth problem, which we'll still want to solve. Uh, and just to give one more example of this, another one is uh, solving structured linear programs, such, uh, specifically packing and covering LPs, which are these uh, linear programs where all of the um, vectors uh, are, are non-negative. So the matrix, the constraint matrix is non-negative, the weight vector is non-negative. And for these, uh, we can uh, design iterative solvers that are, um, that are more efficient than general linear programming, at least in, uh, in certain regimes. And one, one approach is actually to, uh, to sort of slightly change this objective uh, using some ideas. So, so since, since this is a very hard constraint that we're, we're trying to enforce there, which is a um, AX at most B, a natural approach is actually to move it into the objective via uh, Lagrangian, run, uh, Lagrangian variables and uh, make the objective a little bit nicer by adding a strongly concave function to it. So, so this is called rigorization. So, so we can add uh, here, it actually turns out we can add a nice function like the entropy uh, to this optimization. And we're going to get uh, a formulation uh, which is uh, very nice to work with, but unfortunately is not globally smooth. So, so this is another example in, in combinatorial optimization. And uh, an important theme in, in, in the work that has been happening in the algorithm design community was to, to overcome the limitation, these limitations of the lack of uh, smoothness or strong convexity by leveraging other problem structure, which is specific to the discrete problem. And there's been a very fruitful line of work uh, achieving great progress on many directions. And, uh, and for example, for the packing and covering LPs, uh, there's a, a partial smoothness that we can leverage uh, to get uh, accelerated solvers. And for problems such as maximum flows, there are alternatives to strong convexity, such as error convexity that we can use instead. And there's been some beautiful follow-up works, many of by the, the people who are here in the audience and throughout the program. Michael? Maxing out for the, for the second example, it's non-smooth because of X or because of Y? The, the... Yeah, so, so for this one, actually, uh, so, so I didn't write it here because, uh, um, yeah, so, so we're, uh, it's not uh, too important for, for what we were talking about. But yeah, so we will not leave it as a min-max. Uh, it's actually, this inner uh, maximization has a completely explicit analytical expression. So you can actually write down exactly what this is. Just take the derivative and set it to zero and see exactly what it is. And you're going to get an explicit function, and then we're going to have a minimization over an explicit function that happens to be non smooth globally. Uh, it, it is differentiable everywhere, just the smoothness grows as you get like, farther and farther away. Yes. Irreconcilable what you're asking. <laughs> because there's an entropy inside, so that seems nice. <laughs> so, so it's differentiable yeah. in any like bounded region that's smooth, but over the whole domain. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the smoothness grows, I would say, over the whole domain of the non-negative orbit. The smoothness keeps growing, and growing. But if you're not going too far away, there's a you have smoothness, and this is what I meant by partial or local smoothness. So there's no global L that works over the entire domain, but locally you can. Good. So, so this is just a, a, a more, more way uh, for a pointer uh, to all of the connections. Uh, let me also mention a little bit of what, what else can we do in the non-smooth setting, which is also what we already alluded to uh, because Michael asked about it, which is that 
Um, there's the uh, important and useful class of functions for which we can design gradient descent uh, algorithms, even if in the non-smooth setting. And this is the, uh, the, the setting where we have a bounded gradient. So, uh, so at, a, uh, at any point x, the length of the gradient is no more than some constant, let's call it g. So one example you want to mention to think about is the absolute value, right? So the, uh, the gradients are on most one. So, so for, uh, for, for this class of functions, um, we can design a gradient descent scheme. So, so we can set a step size. Uh, so, so there's several, uh, there are a couple of options. We can use a fixed step size if we know the number of iterations ahead of time. If we don't, uh, we can use a time varying step size, uh, like one over square root of t, and, and uh, perform the gradient update. Uh, but now, unlike the, uh, non like the smooth setting, because the function is no longer smooth, we actually, we, are, we no longer have this nice property that the algorithm is going to monotonically decrease the objective. In fact, sometimes it increases and sometimes it decreases, but on average, it's, uh, it is quite good. So, so, so there we can return the uniform average, like and this uh, uh, ties in with Michael's question from the beginning. And what is the convergence that we can show there? Um, so, so we can show that we can uh, converge uh, at uh, one over square root of t rate, uh, which, uh, which in other words, in order to get an epsilon approximate solution, we now have to make one over epsilon squared number of iterations. So if you remember, in the smooth setting, it was just one over epsilon, but here actually it's quadratically worse. So, so this is actually a much slower convergence than in the smooth setting, unfortunately for us, but also it is optimal in this black box model. So, so we cannot do any better just xt here it wouldn't work Sorry. so the, the okay. so the question is uh, if we were to return just xt would it not work it would work in the sense that it still converges at a slightly uh, uh, slower rate uh, so uh, you you get an additional log t oh i see there's not much of it. Um, yeah, so, so I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly in exactly in what settings you can, in what convergence you can prove exactly for the last iterate, but uh, it, it, it converges uh, in important settings uh, at a slower rate. Yeah, maybe we, I can look it up again for you offline. All right, so, um, so, so, so let me mention one more four pointer. So, so this was non-smooth optimization. And we're, so once again, this is just a, a four pointer for those of you who are interested in learning more. So, so let me uh, take a couple more minutes and give one more four, four pointer before we wrap up uh, for, for this part of the lecture and talk about uh, stochastic gradient descent very briefly, uh, which, and, and this was already a topic that was already mentioned. Um, so in, uh, and uh, the, the high level message here is that in many settings, uh, both in algorithm design and beyond, uh, the objective function that we have has additional structure uh, and that enables faster gradient descent algorithms via random sampling. And one example of such a structure is what is called a finite sum structure, where our overall objective f is actually the sum of uh, these functions fi and these functions fi on their own are much more structured than f itself. And, uh, and this arises in many, in many settings uh, in computer optimization, but also as well, such as machine learning optimization and beyond. And uh, for us, uh, one, uh, one example that we, uh, or two examples that we can keep in mind from computer optimization are uh, structure problems such as, let's say, maximum flows and minimum cuts. And there, uh, the sum structure comes about that uh, the, our formulations uh, are usually edge-based. Or so, so it says very. So if we look at a single edge, uh, we can define a function on just that edge. Uh, so for example, the minimum cut, right? So so that we have the global minimum cut, but it's composed of all of these different edges, and we can actually capture the, that structure in a finite sum. And, and this also generalizes beyond uh, minimum cuts. For example, certain classes of Samadra functions um, also fit this model. 
And there's, there's been many works that explores the structure uh, for, for these uh, combinatorial optimization problems. And a uh, uh, final strong structure like this uh, uh, can often be uh, leveraged to obtain improved running times. Uh, and, and the idea is that instead of actually computing the exact gradient in every iteration, which will involve uh, n gradient computations, right? So, so for each of these functions fi, we're going to compute their gradient. So what you can do instead is just to stochastically approximate it. So for example, we could choose uh, one of those functions fi, uniformly at random, let's say. Uh, so choose an i uniformly at random and only compute the gradient of that fi. And for a, a very structured problem like the one we're interested in, that is actually much cheaper than computing the whole gradient. And, and, and we can use that uh, random variable uh, as in a, a stochastic approximation to the gradient. And, uh, and we can go ahead and replace the gradient and gradient descent uh, by the stochastic gradient estimator. And that will go, going to give us stochastic gradient descent. So, so that's, uh, that's uh, one example. And also, uh, and this is a, a, it's a very influential approach, uh, both in algorithm design, but in also in other settings, such as machine learning. Uh, we rely on stochastic gradient descent significantly. Uh, and beyond uh, finite sum, uh, let me mention one more connection that is relevant to this program, which is that of random coordinate descent. Uh, so, so now, uh, instead of uh, exploiting the finite sum structure, so now uh, the idea on random coordinate descent is that we, we can uh, oftentimes achieve speed ups for important problems by computing uh, just a single coordinate of uh, the gradient. So, so instead of um, using the entire gradient, we're going to use the entry of the gradient for a, an index that is randomly chosen, not necessarily uniformly, uh, according to some distribution. And uh, this allows us to get uh, uh, fast running times for very important problems. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, uh, Aaron and Insta's paper is, uh, is a great reference for that. All right. And with that in mind, I'll stop here uh, for this lecture. And when we come back, we're going to talk about accelerated gradient design. Thank you. Uh, questions? All right, uh, so we have a break until uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, we'll come back then, but let's uh, first uh, thank Alina again. Thank you.